What's up guys, I've got a really good one for you here today. And I think some of you may already know, I was featured on Al Jazeera's The Listening Post in what was a bizarre, incoherent and awkward piece that they tried so hard to frame in a certain way, but ended up delivering a, kind of like an embarrassingly ridiculous uh, final result. And we're gonna get into that in a bit. Now, in this piece, they said that they reached out to me for an interview uh, or to ask me questions. I didn't see anything from them. We'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, but I reached out to them, uh, to both uh, Minakshi Ravi, the journalist who worked on this piece, and Richard Gisbert, the creator and host of the show. He was also in the video. And I told them, hey, guys, I'm available anytime for an interview. And I said, hey, you know what? Do you mind also coming on to my show? It wasn't conditional on that. But I said, I'd like you to have you I'd like to have you on my show to talk about this piece and, and learn about journalism and how something like this is put together. I mean, because it seems really dishonest from the outside. And it'll be a good chance for you to um, restore some faith in what you do if this really was an honest piece of journalism. I didn't word I, I worded it much nicer than that um, in in some of the exchanges, and I'll show you that in a bit. Um, and I to sweeten the deal and to really encourage them to do uh, to do it, I said, uh, hey, you know, I'll even donate five hundred dollars to a charity of their choice. Uh, but uh, Minakshi refused to participate, and the reasons for that um, will become pretty obvious when we start digging into this here. Um, so I'm going to play a few different clips. Uh, let, let's just jump right into the first clip. Beijing started with a strategy of denial on the existence of the camps, producing documentaries showing happily reformed Uyghurs. Then came a more aggressive approach, strictly controlled access for foreign journalists, threats made against critical reporters. So right out of the gate, they start with the disinformation. Uh, Beijing started with a strategy of denial but they were also showing graduates uh, dancing Uyghurs saying they were reformed. I mean, so which is it? Did they say they didn't exist or did, do you just simply think they tried to over beautify it? I mean, you've got to choose one or the other. And the idea that they tried to deny it is completely misrepresented. This is a rumor that started in 2018 when China officially called them vocational training centers. What they rejected before that point was the idea of people calling them concentration camps or using similar kind of alarmist language and words. Before 2018, you could find these centers referred to as transformation through education programs. So what the media creatively did was they used the renaming of the program to say before that point, they denied vocational training centers ever existed, when in fact they just renamed them. Uh, or at least started officially referring to them as vocational training centers. I mean, this stuff is, for an investigative journalist, th th this is stuff they could find easily. And... In terms of the last bit, where he said there was controlled access and threats made in regards to critical journalism, I mean, maybe Richard can tell me what threats I would have received for saying Beijing is disconnected from the sentiment on the ground and that I don't believe the Chinese media and that many local government uh, officials are incompetent. I mean, this report tried so hard to paint me as a strictly uncritically thinking mouthpiece, when in fact, what I'm going to do for you today is to prove that that's exactly what Al Jazeera is, but of course, in the opposite direction. So let's uh, just move on to the next clip. It is clear that a new phase of official spin is now underway. China's adding some Western faces to the mix, white ones, online influencers who contend that the Xinjiang story is being overblown by the Western media. Oh, a new official spin, is it? And uh, <laughs> white faces? <laughs> I mean, there, <laughs> there we go again. I mean, I, I've lost count of how many times people have called me white. They literally used multiple clips from a video where I looked like this. This was a video that they used, a screenshot from that video. You know, I mean, in the, I'm not even only my normal brown here. I'm, I'm like super brown because I just came back from Tibet and the sun was just, you know, roasting me there. Uh, I mean, is it because my fingertips are white? Like, what's, what's going on here? But, I, I mean, I don't know. You know, anyways, um, thank you, I presume, for what you believe is an upgrade from brown, Mr. Gisbert. That's uh, very kind of you. <laughs> uh, you know... I've been analyzing this uh, phenomena for quite a while, and the best guess I have so far, all of the evidence that uh, you know points towards um, an idea that if I, no matter how brown I look, no matter how physically brown I look, if I articulate myself in his white language clearly, uh, proficiently, and without an accent, 
uh, well, I mean, that's debatable. I, somebody could say I have an, a Canadian accent, but you know what I mean, that there's no way I could just simply be a brown guy. Uh, there are serious racist implications to this, if I'm correct, and I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, you know, I'm right about the smug Mr. Gisbert here. Um, but I guess the other thing that be go could be going on is that um, Gisbert thinks that China needs white faces for legitimacy. After all, it makes sense. White opinions have generally been the ones that matter, right? Maybe he even thinks they're superior. So even while directly looking at me, even while directly looking at a brown guy, the moment he thinks the Chinese government is propping him up, Suddenly, he can't possibly be brown because that wouldn't make any sense. That'd be kind of stupid. Why would you prop up a brown guy? <laughs> I mean, I don't know how to wrap my head around this, uh, but it, it, it's just totally bizarre. Uh, but anyway, so let's move on here. For the past couple of months, these particular voices have all been speaking about one topic. What's up, guys? Coming at you from Kashgar Ancient City in Xinjiang. They say this like it's something unusual. The, the entire world is focused on Xinjiang, saying the most ridiculous, out of touch with reality, unverifiable things about Xinjiang, even to the point where people are saying they want to boycott the Olympics. And they're surprised that as a result, foreigners living in China are listening and have all of a sudden taken an interest to see what's going on as well. It makes absolute logical sense. But let's be honest here. You're mostly just disappointed that we're not following your narrative, aren't you? Let's move to the next video. Influencers like Canadian Daniel Dumbrell, Israeli Raz Galor, or the British father-son duo Lee and Ollie Barrett have followers in the millions on the video sharing site Bilibili, TikTok, and Weibo, China's version of Twitter. Followers in the millions on Bilibili and Weibo. Uh, I mean, <laughs> this is easy to look up. This is really, really easy to look up. Like. Did you just pull this out of your backsides? I mean, how about you just go and check my account? I have 20,000 followers on Weibo. I got most of them very recently after people started searching for my name because of uh, my video that went viral not too long ago. Um, so why so few and why so late? Because I don't focus on Chinese social media at all. I do have 50,000 followers, a far, a far cry from a million, 50,000 followers on Bilibili, and I never check it. Someone else helps me upload some of my YouTube videos there once in a while, but I really am not concerned with it at all. And as for TikTok, I don't even have an account. So this here is their first set of absolute blatant lies. No one has provided any evidence that the Chinese government has directly paid these influencers to churn out their videos. Churn out. You, uh, you do see what they did here, right? Churn out. I don't make videos. I'm not a content creator. I'm someone who churns out videos in a mechanical way to serve some sort of an external purpose. You'll notice this kind of very selective language used all the time, depending on whether they're talking about someone whose opinion they'd like to validate versus those that they'd like to invalidate. Uh, this is a very common tactic through most anti-China propaganda, uh, especially prominent in the works put out by think tanks like ASPI. And actually, somebody did a deep dive into the language used in ASPI reports. Very, very interesting, very revealing um, things that you wouldn't, a lot of people wouldn't think about while they're reading through it. But the choice of language sets the framing uh, that really puts you in the mood and the mode that they want. Uh, so check that out. I'll put that in the description. But uh, let's move to the next clip. The vloggers themselves recently, in a curiously simultaneous push, posted videos refuting allegations that they are paid by the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP. No, we are not paid by the CCP to make specific, uh, positive content about China. In a curious, simultaneous push, we posted videos refuting allegations that we were paid by the Chinese Communist Party, eh? Please do tell, Manakshi. While indeed I'm not paid by, for my content by anyone, let us all know, when did I ever produce a video saying I wasn't paid by the Chinese government, once again, even though I'm not, and how coordinated was it? Give us some dates. Tell me when, when all of these different vloggers started saying that they're not paid by the Chinese government. I can tell you 100%. I can tell everybody watching this now. No matter how much you push, no matter how much you ask Minakshi, she will not answer this question ever. Why? Because once again, it's just something she decided to randomly make up and stick in her report. So here's your next outright blatant lie, folks. Let's move on to the next video. We messaged Daniel Dumbrell, requested an interview, and didn't get a response. CGTN appears to be his favorite broadcaster. This is an interesting one. 
After asking multiple times, uh, Menakshi provided me with a screenshot of Arthur uh, Osinki, I believe his name was, um, showing that he sent me a direct message on Twitter on April 23rd. I went through my inbox, both my main Twitter inbox and the message requests inbox, which shows DMs from people I don't follow. I'm, I'm usually pretty uh, bad at getting back to people on messages, but um, I would have seen that. Um, and neither section, neither inbox shows that uh, on that date or even the surrounding dates that I ever got a notification from Arter, con Arter contacting me. Uh, you can see that I did get a request to get interviewed by China's um, Global Times, which I didn't even respond to. I just ignored. Uh, but here's the really curious thing. Um, I think this should be looked into more. I, I don't know how deliberate this was or how possible it is to orchestrate something like this. If I go to Arthur's profile directly and if I choose to send him a, a DM, I can then see the message he sent me. I don't know if anyone has any uh, further insight into this issue. I tried doing some searching. Um, you know, my suspicion is there's some sort of a feature, uh, like a recall feature or some sort of a uh, something that they're exploiting to have been able to send me a message um, without it actually showing up in my notifications, in my inboxes. I don't know how somebody would accomplish that, but if somebody could help me, uh, if, if somebody has any insight into this and could post something in the comment section, this would be huge. Uh, because if they're doing this all the time to their guests, um, I'm going to start researching this a bit more and seeing how many times they've done this to other people and if they noticed a similar kind of anomaly. Um, you know, you know, let's look back at the uh, inboxes. You can see, you know, I know I blurred some of the names out here. I don't want to share, you know, I don't know if these people want me to share their messages, but you'd see his first lines from his message saying, dear Daniel, if any of these blurred out messages were his, uh, it's just not there. Now, I will say that there was a Twitter outage and issues reported on April 23rd. So it may have been related to that. Uh, but I, I, I mean, I might be overthinking it, but i really, really suspicious about this. But regardless, they only sent me one message. And even though there were multiple people featured in their report, they didn't have a single person on their show refuting the claims made against them. And there wasn't even, just in general, there wasn't even one person showing the other side of the argument. Instead, their guests were 100% stacked anti-China activists. And I don't believe this is a coincidence. I think it's a direct reflection of what kind of effort they put in to get differentiating opinions on their show. And the final product is exactly what they wanted to accomplish. Any reasonable and honest person or journalist, I use the word journalist loosely these days because I don't even know what the heck it means anymore, would have looked at this final product and have said, this is way too biased. We need to balance this out a bit. And we need to put a little bit more effort in doing so to get some voices on the other side. They didn't do this though. This is what they put out. Um, <laughs> I mean, again, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's uh, uh, unintentional. Um, but before this point, actually, I want to address something. Before this point, she played a clip of me on CGTN on a CGTN interview, saying I was contacted by many media outlets, but I only agreed to go on to CGTN. And she said that CGTN seems to be my favorite news outlet. I want to give you guys a bit of context for this because this is something that a few people picked up on. The fact is, only Chinese media outlets contacted me. I was talking from the perspective of living in China and being interviewed by a Chinese station. Had more Western media outlets contacted me, I would have done way more media appearances after that viral video. I explained this to the BBC also uh, when they reached out to me and that conversation I made public a long time ago on Twitter. People can see that's what I said. If more Western media outlets contacted me about this, I would have I would have done it. Um, you know, the only reason I didn't do the uh, uh, South, uh, Southern China, uh, South China Morning Post was because they said they would cut my answers and they would edit my answers. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, you can't edit my answers. Um, but other than that, nobody really contacted me. Uh, and, and in fact, um, my interest in Western media outlets over Chinese, it's important to note that I actually rejected CGTN in the beginning. But the guy who was responsible for trying to book me ended up uh, being very persuasive and also having a uh, very special connection with me. So uh, I rejected the request twice, uh, but then he started talking about himself and apologized if he seemed a little bit too pushy, um, that he, he just wanted to explain that he really respects my work and he's just a patriotic guy who also grew up in a small Canadian town that I probably wouldn't know. <laughs> then when I said, uh, which town? And he mentions it. It turns out that little town is exactly the tiny little town that I grew up in also. And we started talking about all the different places we used to go and hang out. He went to the same elementary school as my brother. And because of this, I said, you know what? 
I'll come on your show, but I have a couple of uh, conditions though. I said that I might say some negative things about China and I don't want it to be cut out. And I was saying this from experience. I responded to uh, and made some videos responding to some questions for other Chinese, uh, another Chinese media outlet before quite a while ago, and they cut the negative bits out and I didn't like that. So he agreed. And then I also said, I wanted a chance to explain why I chose CGTN and explain our little connection here, our story. Um, so would that be okay if the host asked me that question? And he said, yeah, sure, we can arrange that. Because I, I didn't want to just go into this long monologue in the beginning and just start talking about myself. I, I thought it would help break it up. And he agreed. Uh, but unfortunately, they never answered me. The, they never asked me the question. Uh, I don't think it was intentional. And he was extremely apologetic afterwards. He was really embarrassed by it. I, I, I'll i admit, I was annoyed by it, but whatever. I, I don't think it was a really big deal. Um, but that's the story behind the CGTN interview because two or three people picked up on that and thought that many Western media outlets contacted me and I didn't want to go on it. It's just not the case. Uh, but let's keep going here. Let's uh, see the next video. At the end of March, an online discussion he hosted about accusations of genocide in Xinjiang was played at one of the ministry's press briefings. We have a precedent for fake propaganda created to serve America's geopolitical interests. That video was then tweeted by spokesperson Hua Chunying, one of the most prominent faces of the Chinese government. No, Menakshi. I didn't host that event. This would have been easy to verify as well. That was hosted by a group located in Canada. It was originally held on Zoom using a room someone else set up and, a, and, an, and an event that somebody else organized. Uh, there is your next outright blatant lie, folks. These guys are on an absolute roll at this point. Uh, but hey, you know what? Let's look on the bright side here. Manakshi saw my 12-minute viral video. Not only do I feel honored... I am super excited because she was exposed to the example I raised proving that Western media was deceitful and that the Xinjiang narrative, narrative was um, full of lies. Menakshi could have been the very first mainstream media journalist in the world to address the issue of Tersenate the concentration camp survivor and her story, which changed three times and who apparently had her passport renewed while under arrest. Brilliant. <laughs> no, <laughs> of course not. Right. Of course not. Um, you know, you, you, I mean, not only did she ignore this, not only did she not take issue with the massive, uh, this massive hole in the mainstream media narrative, I, you're not going to believe this. This is just this is going to blow your this is going to blow your mind. Let's just take a look at it. So the primary thing that the Chinese Communist Party wants dissidents or you know human rights activists, journalists to do is to just shut up. So uh, any kind of leverage they can use on people, they will. There was the case recently where two Uyghur women were interviewed on BBC and they talked about you know the rape that happens in these camps, and the Chinese state-run media went and found the family of one of these women and they made her family essentially denounce her on camera. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, you saw that right? That was Tersenay. Not only did Menakshi not care about the holes in Tersenay's story that I pointed out, not only did she not care that CNN blurred out her passport renewal date to hide this critical hole in her story as well, not only did she not um, include this part of my presentation or this part of what I said, she then went ahead and used testimonies, uh, the testimony from Tersenay without even questioning it. The very one that I exposed in the video that she watched in order to prop up the idea of a genocide in Xinjiang. Absolutely remarkable. And, uh, you know, to make it, to make it that much more ridiculous, she got somebody from a Falun Gong media outlet, China Uncensored, who pushes the most out of this world, ridiculous, fake, continually debunked stories and whose religious leader believes mixed race children are a ploy by aliens to uh, destroy the human race to present Tersenay's story. It's almost like she looked at um, she looked at my video and she's like, all right, I'll, I'll, actually, you know, I want to use Tersenay's story. And this is going to be really ridiculous because Daniel just explained in this 12 minute video that I watched that it's probably a BS story. This is going to be kind of funny. How could we make it even more ridiculous? I know. Let's get a Falun Gong media outlet person to present it. <laughs> um, 
You know, one of the first lines in this video from Richard, one of the first lines in your report was that some of us claim that Western media reports on Xinjiang are overblown. But you didn't even include a single example from those of us who indeed say, yes, it's overblown. Even when you looked at me right in my face on my video that you watched, where I handed you an example on a silver platter, you disregarded it, you didn't report it, and you decided to join the ranks of BBC and CNN and all of those other fake investigative journalism shows. I mean, at this point, folks, you can be 100% sure that Manakshi knows exactly what she's doing. She saw me speak specifically about the issues with Tersenay's stories, with uh, Tersenay's story. Or I should say stories because there's three of them now, or four I think she's on now. She decided to not tell her audience about it, then use Tersenay's story to paint a dark picture. I mean, Manakshi is not a journalist. She's a propagandist. I mean, her continual lies, and especially what you see here, proves this beyond any reasonable doubt. Let's see what we have next. But I have to say that I think that for, for Human Rights Watch, the single biggest frustration is that, you know, nobody from the Chinese government has the guts to sit down and talk with us uh, on the facts. Oh, Sophie Richardson. Imagine that. Sophie Richardson from Human Rights Watch, the organization that promotes brutal baby killing sanctions around the world and the overthrowing of foreign governments. And imagine that. She's talking about having guts to respond. Well, Sophie, do you remember that time you did a Reddit AMA and someone asked you some pretty reasonable questions that caused you to start sweating profusely and desperately tried to bury those questions? Well, I remember it. How about we let everyone know about those incredibly respectful questions you were asked and that to this day, nearly a year later, you still haven't answered any of them. And you even managed to mysteriously get the account asking you those questions suspended back then. Um, so let's see your AMA. Let's see how you set things up. I'm Sophie Richardson, China Director at Human Rights Watch. I've written a lot on political reform, democratization, and human rights in China and Hong Kong. Ask me anything. Oh, really, Sophie? Ask you anything. All right. Well, let's take a look at those questions that sent you running. I'm going to put some of these screenshots up. I'm not going to go through all of the words, all of the details. Uh, they're, they're, it's, a, it's a long um, list, uh, but you guys can pause the video and go through it in a little bit more detail. Uh, but just pulling it up here, you can see, first of all, there, uh, there's a, a comment above that was deleted from Sophie. And that was because it was a reply to a reply. And then uh, this guy who was asking these questions I'm talking about provides his sources replied to Sophie. And then Sophie was so desperate to try to uh, bury these questions that she deleted her comment um, in a hope that it would it would bury uh, this guy who's called provides his sources, <laughs> which is a nice name for it. Um, so. You know, he goes into it basically saying, this is really frustrating. There's nothing. This is an academic also who um, who asked these questions. He said, this is really frustrating. Like none of this is none of this is academic. She, they took out specific examples of things they say, saying, can you provide evidence for these? Your article doesn't even explain what you mean by these terminologies. Like, how do you define them? Um, asking, you know, uh, you know, why do you think uh, China should be sanctioned? Um, what kind of credible evidence is there? Um, it goes on to say, yeah, credible estimates. They use the word credible estimates. He says, what, what exactly makes them credible? Because they don't explain. They just say as a general word, oh, yeah, we have credible estimates. Um, you know, a lot of uh, um, research based on select witness testimonials who seem to have um, a bias and other uh, another agenda. Um, he talks about the researchers continually using the uh, term re-education, and he's asking, well, what, what exactly is the difference between education and re-education? It's a pretty good question. Um, he talks about the entire framing of the, 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 the problematic framing and conclusions that were drawn. And obviously the only way another user at the bottom recognized that the, uh, the comment that this was in reply to was deleted to push the comments further down. So, um, yeah, I mean, that seemed pretty reasonable. Sophie, what happened? You didn't have the guts to respond to it when you said in advance that we could ask you anything. Well, I guess, you know what, uh, uh, on the other hand, this makes you pretty qualified on matters related to not having any guts. So uh, let's just uh, trust your assessment on this one, Sophie. <laughs> let's go to the next video. The first thing I noticed about the video from Roz Galor is the, there were a lot of propaganda messages in it right up front. 
That was a simpler, lighter clip. I love this because um, China, this is China Uncensored, somebody from China Uncensored talking about propaganda. Most of my followers are going to know why this is really funny. Um, once again, this is the Falun Gong media outlet I was talking about, whose counterparts actually pushed out massive amounts of pro-Trump propaganda as well during the elections. Um, you know, and again, towards the end, she talks about, it's so strange. They're, they're going to all these places we're talking about. You know, it's, it's not surprising that these Muppets are pretending that it's odd. Somebody would go to visit, for example, a cotton farm in Xinjiang when there are so many accusations against them. It, it, it's like, you know, what, what do you, what do you expect them to do? Like people are curious about it because of how big this narrative is. I mean, uh, the truth is that these people, they don't want to see footage from the source because they know the story they'd like to push is completely BS and is disconnected from any reality on the ground. So the best thing um, to do to stay, uh, the best thing from their perspective to do is just stay as far away from the ground as you can. And this is exactly why when uh, Nike, uh, Nike and H&M simply stated that they're concerned about forced labor allegations, they were given so much media airtime about their concerns. But Skechers, who actually went to investigate multiple times and unannounced said they found no evidence to support these claims, almost got no attention at all. People aren't looking for the truth. And the best way to protect people from the truth is to either ignore or villainize the people who actually go and have a look themselves. That's what it is. Let's see who we have next. They're taking legitimate criticisms of the U.S. government and trying to say just because the U.S. government has these issues, nothing, nothing that has been so far reported about the Uyghurs can possibly be true. Well, would you look at that? Another Falun Gong media connected personality, Amalia Pung, the woman who looked in the mirror and suddenly realized she was part Uyghur because of her high cheekbones. Coincidentally, right when the Uyghur issue was a hot topic and she began selling a book on forced Uyghur labor. <laughs> I'm not joking here, guys. This is a real article and a real tweet she put out. You know, uh, I'm sorry it took a genocide for me to remember that I'm Uyghur. Uh, like, you can't, you can't make this stuff up. This is who they found. Um, this is who they stacked their anti-China uh, all-star dream team with on this report. Um, you know, according to Amalia, you know, d d going into that story into a little bit more detail, um, she suddenly discovered that her grandmother was half Uyghur. And now she goes as far as blaming um, the Chinese Communist Party for her inability to speak Uyghur. Not because she didn't give a shit about her heritage until it was convenient to do so for her career. And not because she's uh, only allegedly one-eighth Uyghur, but because uh, uh, China bad, of course. <laughs> uh, I don't know what to say, so let's keep going. It's, it's fairly ironic because you can be angry at what the U.S. does, and you can also be angry at what China does. These don't have to be mutually exclusive. But there, of course, the party state has now discovered these groups and is trying to integrate them into their messaging because they're bringing across this key message, don't look at us, look at America. No, Mariki, that's not what we're saying. We're saying that while you're trying to prove something that you're not sure about, we're already sure that you're doing. You know, all of the things that you're accusing China of doing is going on in the countries that you're defending or the countries that, that are funding these, these narratives. So if you're trying to push the idea that countries shouldn't work with China and they should boycott sporting events in China because you're trying to say that China has a, a prison population as bad as the U.S. It has forced labor, just like the uh, uh, prison labor systems in the U.S. And then it commits crimes as bad as the U.S. did in Gitmo, Abu Ghraib and beyond. Then you're telling us because we already know without a doubt that the U.S. has all of these problems. According to your own standards, nobody should be dealing with the U.S. I, I have a feeling this isn't an argument you're going to want to keep when we apply this logic equally. Um, and furthermore, and perhaps more importantly, th the, the legitimacy of the U.S. to lead and fund a human rights battle against China, as if they really care about these things to begin with, is also heavily compromised. Um, the credibility is heavily compromised, especially when you consider how many times they fabricated stories to attack others. It's about perspective. You know, perspective is something you guys love until that perspective shows you something that you don't want people to see. And stop pretending otherwise. Let's move on to the next video. If it was real journalism, Beijing would be looking to control it, not promote it. If this was real journalism, Beijing would be looking to control it, not promote it. What does this even mean? 
Does this mean that if someone working from the Chinese government or any Chinese government organization retweeted or shared an Al Jazeera article that they happen to like and agree with, that um, that article and perhaps your entire news agency is immediately discredited because they promoted it instead of trying to control it? Uh, I mean, does the same logic apply to the if a U.S. government official uh, shares one of your articles as well? I mean, they try to control the narrative as well, don't they? Uh, they have uh, uh, disinformation campaigns, uh, or you can have a chat with Julian Assange if you really don't believe me on that point. But what, I mean, what what exactly is it you're trying to convey here? It, it, it's kind of, I mean, I don't know what to say. It's it's nonsensical. But that's that's a that's a pretty good um, short video to end on uh, for this review portion because it really drives home how incoherent. Uh, this incredible display of of grasping at straws uh, to paint the picture that they'd like really is. Um, you know, I made um, I made a great effort to get uh, Manakshi or Richard on the show, uh, but to no avail. I sent public tweets. Um, I'll share those in the description below. Uh, private uh, DMs through Twitter and emails. Uh, here is the email I sent. Just to give you an idea of uh, how I try to set things up and uh, what they declined, I said, uh, "Hi, Manakshi and Ravi, uh, Manakshi, Ravi, and Richard Gisbert. Thank you for featuring me on your recent report and discussing online China-based influencers. I have a YouTube show with over 150,000 subscribers, many of whom are disappointed in m uh, mainstream media coverage on China, and even go as far as calling it deliberately deceitful and dishonest. Your new report, on the surface at least, would certainly support that conclusion. Therefore, I wondered if you, I could invite you on my show to." Address Address these suspicions using your China Influencer Report as a foundation for that discussion. And you can reassure my audience that it was approached from a place of honesty and fairness. If you accept, I will also donate $500 to a charity of your choosing out of my own pocket. I look forward to hearing back from you. Daniel Dumbrell. In her first response to me, she ignored the request for an interview, completely pretended I didn't ask. Um, and uh, in a follow-up reply, she then outright declined. Uh, however, uh, one of the most interesting parts of her reply, the first reply, was when she said, I understand the concerns people have about the media and the listening post's work over the past decade and a half has been to dissect and analyze how the media works and to chronicle the skepticism and distrust in the media as well. <laughs> I, I mean, this has to be the most ironically unself-aware things I've I've ever read this year um you know some of you must be wondering why journalists like these are so deliberately uh, dishonest and deceitful um noam chomsky's book uh, manufacturing consent offers some insight into this there's a video there's a really nice short video that um breaks down the five different components of um how the media is shaped and molded into whatever it is that they want. Um, I'll share the link to that in the description. But what I'll do here is I'll share an older clip, a very short clip of Noam confronting a BBC reporter. How, how, can, you, how can you know that I'm self-censoring? How can you I know that you're journalists self -censoring. are... I'm sure you believe everything you're saying. But what I'm saying is if you believe something different, you wouldn't be sitting where you're sitting. So... Not all journalists are deliberately deceitful. Sometimes they really believe these narratives and their bias is so, so extreme that they'll make very stupid conclusions. Uh, media outlets cultivate these kinds of sheep and allow them to climb the ranks to shape uh, the messages um, in a way that satisfies the organization's goals. However, um, this was a long time ago. Back then, the system worked in a kind of a you know, survival of the fittest or survival of the shittiest kind of a system. Um, where people were selected based on having the right ideas. Um, and that's who was promoted. But now, though, I think people can see through the game and they make a conscious choice to sell their soul in order to get ahead, just like Manakshi Ravi and Richard Gisbert does. Uh, you know, we, I mean, we saw journalists fired for even having been belonging to a pro-Palestinian group while they were in college. There was that AP journalist that was fired recently. What do you think would happen to Manakshi if she really did pay attention to the critical hole in Tersenay's story and admit there's something seriously problematic here? I mean, unlike me, Manakshi is paid to do what she does, and she knows full well that bringing up this issue would disappoint her paymasters. She has made an active and conscious decision to conduct herself without any dignity or self-respect in exchange to get ahead, and perhaps one day to make more money and become more influential. Well... A superficial kind of influence as long as it as long as she remembers to follow the general rules 
So uh, I, I'm going to end it here, though, guys. Uh, I think I've been going on for, yeah, for way too long. Um, you know, as I understand, there's going to be a BBC hit piece coming out on me soon, which I'm really looking forward to. Uh, I love breaking apart these reports, especially when they're about me, because they give me the perfect opportunity to show you guys from the inside exactly what I've been talking about so much on my channel for so long. So uh, until the next video, guys, I hope you're all doing well. Uh, take care and see you next time. Peace.